Excellent. Hey, everybody. Um, as Noah said, I'm Mike, and this is Emergent Storytelling in Physical Spaces. Our the sort of provo provocative version is, is Sleep No More a roguelike? Um, so what I do is I make games and toys and things that are kind of like games. Um, but really what I do is I make things that look like games but are actually interaction design research, um, looking at how can we take weird, novel, physical interactions with technology and what does that change about your interaction with some experience or the real world. Um, so I'm going to take us a little farther afield than we've talked so far. Um, so we've talked a lot about very formal traditional roguelikes with top-down ASCII graphics and turn-based dungeon crawling. Um, we've talked about things that we still call roguelikes now. They have a lot of the same mechanics, but they don't look like the sort of top-down dungeon crawler, but they're still digital games. We've talked about Twitter bots and things that use procedural generation in cool ways. Um, I want to talk about wandering around in physical space, um, in immersive theater. And these things seem superficially very different from roguelikes, um, but I'm curious at in what ways are they actually kind of similar? Um, in what ways are the ways they tell stories actually maybe even the same? Um, specifically, I'm going to talk a bit about computational flinner. This is a generative poetry walk I built for the Come Out and Play Festival last year. Um, came out of my research with the MIT Media Lab. Um, so this is an experience you go to Fort Mason here in San Francisco. Um, you put your headphones in, you wander around the park, and as you wander, a robot makes up and reads you poetry based on where you go. So you walk by the water, here are poems of the sea. You walk by the cannons, here are poems of war, that sort of thing. Um, and so in a sense, you can already see this sort of feels maybe like a roguelike. There's a lot of procedural generation. You're exploring a physical space. Um, I think there are two things in particular I really want to get into. One of them is that, and sort of, we've talked a lot about what it means for procedural generation to work and what is interesting proc gen. How does that change when you're now dealing with atoms instead of bits? Um, what are the practical considerations? Um, but I also want to talk more broadly about storytelling. Sort of how do, how do games tell stories? Um, and if this is sort of one part immersive theater, one part procedural generation toy roguelike, you know, how are, how does this merge those traditions in a way that says something about how we can make better stories? Um, so for that second part, let's start by talking about what is emergent storytelling, um, which is really how do games tell stories? Um, so if you take a Final Fantasy or a Legend of Zelda or your like, gamey game of choice, um, there are really two stories going on. There is the story of the big evil bad just trying to save the world or take over the world. You're the hero, you have to save them, you have to go to the dungeon. That's one story. There's also the story of you, the player, making specific individual choices. Um, this was sort of much more part of the game's discourse a decade ago. Um, I like Mark Laidlaw from Valve, uh, worked on Half-Life and Portal and a bunch of great games. He talks about embedded versus emergent narrative. Um, emergent narrative are these individual player-driven stories. Embedded narrative is the authored content that exists within there. Um, I really like this framing because it means that the game itself exists, and that's where the story is. But then you can also stud it with hand-authored content instead of thinking of it as, here's a story, and then you're going to play some game every so often. Um, but when you think about roguelikes, like roguelikes can have both of these. Um, we've seen some great examples this weekend of roguelikes that have really good embedded narrative, um, whether it's Tim talking about, here's studying hand-authored content into a roguelike procedurally generated game, or Jason just now talking about how does a bot hand author that content? Um, and I guess Jason's example is a little weird because that definitely ties into the mechanics. But there is a sense with which like, that, is, that is embedded narrative. Um, but what roguelikes are really special at, and I think better than any other genre of game, is this emergent storytelling and creating space for players to come up with their own stories. Um, so what does that even mean? Like, What is emergence, if we're going to talk about emergent storytelling? Um, this is a systems theory concept. Um, where basically you have these small objects that interact with each other and create these sort of larger objects and structures that have some sort of behavior that the smaller things don't exhibit. Um, like this is a textbook example, the glider in Conway's Game of Life. Um, Conway's Game of Life is very straightforward. You have these little individual cells with very specific rules about when they'll ever die. And somehow out of that you get this sort of self-replicating pattern that shows up and flies across the screen. You wouldn't have guessed that from rules about when a cell lives or dies. Um, and roguelikes with their sort of very complex simulations of the world create this very well. You have very, very small rules of here is, here's how water works in this world, here is how kobolds move, and that 
raise, give, that gives away to really interesting stories. Um, like a game of chess has interesting emergent storytelling. Like two people sitting down and playing a game of chess has really interesting, meaningful stories that come out of the rules of chess and a competitive meta and sort of two different people f trying to think of what the other person's gonna do. But that seems different to me than the sort of human computer interface and collaboration of how can, how can I stumbling through this possibility space created by dynamic systems tell something interesting and meaningful. Um, a really bad example is this sort of popular clickbait door fortress bug where you know, someone would go to the bar in the morning and there'd be cat vomit everywhere. Um, and it turns out like when dwarves drink, they spill beer on the floor, cats walk on the floor, they get beer in their paws, their paws are dirty, they lick the paws, they get drunk, they throw up. Um, and again, like, I think this isn't a great example because this, is, this isn't a player story, this is just a story of a simulation going. Um, but it gets at sort of what happens when you have these really interesting systems colliding in interesting ways with combinatorial explosion of complexity. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but if you're interested in this, last year Brian Walker gave an amazing talk about designing Brogue, um, specifically looking at this. Like what does it mean to design a game so that like an advanced level player who's played the game a million times still has interesting stories emerge. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, but so I'm gonna take a total left turn and talk more about physical spaces. Um, this is Sleep No More. Uh, how many of you know it or have seen it? Or Cool, maybe about half, maybe a little less. Um, it is ostensibly a theater production of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth and Hitchcock's Rebecca, um, told through interpretive dance. But it's not really, like you show up at the space and the set is a six or seven story building that takes up a whole city block in Manhattan. Um, there's also a Shanghai production now. Um, and you're given a mask and told to go wherever you want. And for the two or three hours you're there, the idea is if you wanna follow a character, you can do that. If you wanna sit in a single room and see what happens, you can do that. If you wanna hang out in the library and eat the candy in the candy shop, that is also a perfectly viable way to experience Sleep No More. Um, and so this is also, like, this is also a system for generating player stories. Like, it is not, it is not about the embedded narrative of Macbeth. If you wanna know the story of Macbeth, this is the worst possible way to learn it. You will have no idea what is happening. Um, but it is really about, like, what, what is your experience in this space? And sort of a, an unofficial, like one of the most important parts of seeing it is if you go with friends, like after the show, you'll gather at a bar or whatever and talk about what you saw. Um, and everyone's gonna have seen different things. You will all have different, interesting individual stories. Um, and what's interesting there is that's not emerging out of these building blocks of complex, dynamic computer code simulating real world things. This is a very highly plotted out clockwork piece of theater. Um, where I would love to see the stage manager's binder where they probably know where any given actor is at any given moment of time in the show. Um, and so like this, it feels like you wouldn't expect emergent behavior because this is so deterministic, um, but the possibility space is so large that any individual player wandering through the space is going to find interesting moments of synchrony. Um, I wanna give an example. Uh, this is a minor spoiler, so if you care about going in totally pristine, um, plug your ears, it's gonna be really short, the next slide will tell you when I'm done. Um, so when you first show up, uh, you get led into a bar, this sort of smoky jazz bar with live music and absinthe shots and like a perfectly calculated amount of fake smoke. Um, and somewhere on the third or fourth floor, I early on found an exact replica of that set, except it was completely abandoned, covered in cobwebs, looked like it hadn't been touched in 50 years. Um, and I came in there, everywhere else I went was totally swamped with other players or audience members wearing masks and running around, and this was totally deserted. Um, and it totally shifted my perception of, like, what, is, what story is this telling? What is going on with my perception of time? Like, what does this mean for this world? And then I left and went off into some other things and came back, and it was just a normal set. It looked like the bar, there were tons of people there, actors and audience members, and it was one of the busiest sets in the entire piece. Um, and those two moments were sort of the two moments I took away from that, that viewing of it. And no one I've ever talked to had that same experience. Um, and, and like, you can imagine how like, other people could experience this. Like, this was probably written at some level so that it would happen. Um, but this was still a story that felt like it was just for me and that other people didn't get to experience this. Um, and it's interesting thinking about this emergence then as you, you can find interesting personalized meaning in this thing that is relatively set in stone for some definition of set in stone. Um, 
So I'm gonna talk about something that's a little even more fixed. This is a piece that I think even less of you will be familiar with. This is an audio walk called Her Long Black Hair. Uh, Janet Cardiff is a sound artist 10 to 15 years ago. She made a whole bunch of these audio walks. Um, I talk about her Central Park Walk because it's still available. This guy named Dan Pfeiffer, or Dan Pfeiffer, um, got her permission to put them online. So instead of renting a disc man from her, you can actually just download it as a podcast, um, which I highly recommend if you're ever in New York. Part of me talking about it is because I want more people to do this. Um, so it is a 25 minute walk through Central Park um, where like, she very explicitly walks you through the set path. It is a piece of pre-recorded audio that has not changed in 15 years. Um, and yet it still creates that same sense of this is a story that is just for you and you're experiencing things that no one else is, um, which is really interesting. And so there is, there is this sort of formal, there's a framing narrative of why she's taking you on this journey. She is telling you little stories about the world, but it's really about the binaural audio soundscape she's creating and the things you're overhearing in the park. Um, and she does a lot of very clever things with the interaction with the actual real physical space that are worth diving into, because this isn't like Sleep No More. This is, this is not a space that Punch Drunk has complete control over the way that a game developer has full control over you know, the full world of their digital roguelike. Um, there are elements of the park that are the park. Like there are things that will never change that she plays really well off of. Like early on, you're walking north, uh, and then behind you on 59th Street, you hear a police siren using really good binaural positional audio, so it sounds like it's coming from behind you. Um, it's baked in because it's an audio recording, so if you turn your head, it turns with you and totally breaks the illusion. I could give a whole other talk about how like, the amazing psychological tricks she uses to make sure that you don't actually turn your head, but that's a totally different discussion. Um, this is a thing where it works because you don't know if it's real or not, and that works because as long as there are cars in Manhattan, you're gonna hear police sirens on 59th Street. Um, so already, even though this is a moment that everyone experiences, because you are there physically and having it, this feels like a special part of your story that no one else is hearing. Um, relatedly, there are things that aren't as set in stone, but they're equally meaningful whether they've changed or haven't. Like there is, at one point she walks you through the Central Park Zoo, and she talks about a polar bear. Um, and if the actual polar bear was there, that would be really cool. And you'd say, oh, you know, she knows where I am. That's really amazing. Um, but also if the polar bear is not there, like thematically the piece is all about the passage of time and accepting the past and things that change. And hearing her talk about this polar bear that's probably been dead for 10 years, that is also a really interesting story. Um, and again, this is like that first class of things where these are moments that everyone has, but being in a physical space in a park by yourself makes this feel like your story in a way that you know, playing a scripted sequence in a Call of Duty game or a AAA video game doesn't feel like yours. Um, the more interesting thing though are the things she can't know about, that you are walking through a public park. Um, at the most extreme level, one of the times I did this piece, there was a movie shoot going on and we couldn't walk through where she wanted us to walk because Keanu Reeves was acting. Um, and that was really interesting. But even at a subtle level, like, you the weather might change, when you are doing it, who are you doing it with, what strangers will be doing in the park, because it is Central Park, there are always people there. Um, that, that shapes your experience in a way, like if, if roguelikes are the intersection of these digital systems, if Sleep No More is the intersection of your path through this sort of brute forced, gigantic wall of content, this is a small piece of authored content mixed with the uncertainty of the real world, um, which, is less powerful as a means of creating interesting stories that are unlike anyone else's, but it's still pretty effective. Um, and so that brings us to computational flaneur, which was my attempt to sort of how do, you, how do you take that Janet Cardiff approach, which is great because it's cheap, it's reproducible, anyone can download this podcast. How do you, how do you bring in the things that are more beautiful about experiences like Sleep No More or traditional procedural generation? Um, and so at a nuts and bolts level, like this, as you walk through the park, there's sort of an input system that's gathering all sorts of sensor data from the phone in your pocket. Um, it's passing that off to a procedural generation system. I have a neural network trained on a large corpus of mid 20th century poetry. Um, so you give it some inputs, it figures out what it wants to generate, it spits out some poems, a uh, text-to-speech synthesizer reads it out to you. Um, reads you out maybe two lines of poems at a time, and then while it's reading it out to you, it'll generate the next snippet. Um, and I'm using uh, an Irish text-to-speech voice, partly because it seems thematic, but it also masks how horrible bad text-to-speech is, like you find for free on an iPhone. Um, I think sort of the, the overall goal of it, like rather, the, what it shoots for now, and we'll talk about how I got there, was it, it's not supposed to be interesting. 
Um, like, the poems are supposed to be interesting enough to pull you outside of your thoughts as you're walking through the park, but not so interesting to grab your attention. So it's supposed to be sort of a machine for creating awareness of the space around you. Um, and how can I, it's sort of the opposite of Sleep No More or a video game or anything. This is, this is an experience that is supposed to get out of your way and augment your enjoyment of the real world rather than provide my own world for you to live in. Um, and so how I got there was not obvious. So the first, my, the first thing that I failed at was thinking like, okay, Sleep No More is two to three hours and it culminates in this great ending and you're done. Roguelikes, you die and you start over and eventually you're done with that feedback cycle and stop playing for a bit. Uh, Janet Cardiff's walk is literally 25 minutes and then you're done. Um, sort of one touchstone I was interested in was this game Dear Esther, which many of you may have played. You are walking around this craggy Irish rock and hearing sort of prose more so than poetry. And it's not really randomized, it's sort of hand authored but randomized order, but it is much more about this experience of wandering the space than it is about hearing an act the actual like embedded narrative that it's telling you. Um, and so making a physical version of Dear Esther made sense, but when you're dealing with this level of procedural generation, it's really hard to make that coherent, um, especially because what I cared a lot about was this Twitter bot-like aesthetic of you can start anywhere in the park, you can walk for five minutes or five hours and I'll make it work. Um, trying to use music to shape the player's emotional state didn't turn out so well. Um, I thought very briefly about how can you, how can you use like, inputs, how can I figure out if the player's attention is waning and sort of bring things to a close. That was way more trouble than it was worth. Um, so the, the reigning metaphor became how do you make this like a Twitter bot? Um, I think a lot of what I'm gonna talk about now is sort of what it means to make a Twitter bot in the real world, if that's essentially what this is. Um, and a big problem is that black box simulation is indistinct from randomness. Um, I'm, I couldn't find a quote. I think Emily Short talks about this a lot in context of her Versu engine. Um, if you have all of these complex inputs that are coming up with a world state, if the players don't understand that, it's nonsense. Um, so in a roguelike, it makes perfect sense that, okay, this is the way that, this is the way that water works on slippery surfaces. I understand that because it's, it's a metaphor for the real world. Um, originally, I had a lot of sensors coming into play, like you're gonna get a different experience if it's raining, different poems based on how quickly you're moving, what time of day is it, maybe how many other people in the park using your microphone or if other people are doing the experience. People don't really have a good mental model for your friend who is making up poems and reading them to you as you walk around is changing the poem based on how quickly you're walking. Like, who knew? Um, so concretely, the end result was very simple GPS-based. I built this tool that I call Geofencer that let me wander around the space itself and define sort of geographical regions. Um, doing it in person was super important. If you're doing anything location-based, you really need to be on site. Um, so I wandered through Fort Mason and tagged these different regions with, all right, this is the water area. Here are, here are some, some words that are gonna be used to seed the, seed the poetry generator when you're there. Um, ended up not doing anything with sort of probability fields or weighting it based off of where you are. Just if, if you're by the water, you're gonna hear poems about water because that was about the level of legibility of people connecting what they're hearing to what they're seeing, which I think ties a lot into what Darius was saying yesterday about being dumb can be a very good thing. Um, so, so it is interesting about this is that that model then becomes like as you're walking through the park, you know, every so often you're going to keep hearing the stream of consciousness of poetry. A lot of it's not going to be interesting. Every so often you will hear something interesting that connects you to the space. Um, and as I said, this this feels a lot like Twitter bots in a sense, like a a metaphor that I haven't heard used before, but I think seems really apt is that a lot of comedy Twitter bots are basically Skinner boxes. Um, that if you're looking at this Twitter feed, like a lot of the content's not gonna be great. It's gonna be the oatmeal soup problem. Um, and then once every so often, you're gonna get a bowl of oatmeal that has some really nice raisins. Um, and if you look at something like two headlines, um, two headlines grabs a headline and tries <laughs> It tries to grab some really rough heuristics to figure out like what, what noun can I replace with what other noun from the news to make this interesting to a human. And it fires sometimes, but also robots aren't that great at what's know, knowing what's interesting to humans. Um, and some Twitter bots, there's sort of an interesting aesthetic discussion of the form of Twitter bots, like should you curate it and just have a Twitter account that only posts the best stuff, or should you just post everything? Um, in my case, because computational flaneur is real time based on the player's input, I can't curate it. Um, 
all it can do is a similar thing where I'm taking your location, I'm trying to figure out what, what sorts of poems might the robot think is interesting for you, but because its sensory input to the world is so limited, it doesn't always fire. Um, but what does work very well then is because, because this is happening based on your actual input, it feels much more like your story than it does when, it's, when a Twitter bot tweets something funny. A Twitter bot tweets something funny, you laugh a little bit. When a nice moment of synchrony happens here, this feels like it is yours, even though you didn't really do anything other than stand in some GPS coordinates. Um, and because this is happening in the real world rather than on a computer screen, it feels so much more like this is, this is you and the space around you. And even, like, if you go back to that space, even without doing the experience again, it shapes your relationship with that space in a meaningful way that is really interesting. Um, I think that's about all I've got. Um, happy to take questions. Also, I have lots of thoughts about how this sort of stuff applies to more narrative work, but I've talked for enough. <laughs> Questions? Hey, so I think Richard Garriott once described in Ultima that he would put the like flock of sheep uh, next to the town, next to the dragon, so the player could find like the dragon eating the sheep and the townspeople being mad. So if you kill the dragon, then they're not starving anymore because they have sheep. But then like players actually just killed all the sheep and all the townspeople and the dragon. Uh, do you think, do you have any opinions about like how to, how to navigate this challenge of when you give players too many tools or maybe specific tools, their version of an emergent narrative is playing out this kind of, you know, very conventional violent game fantasy? Um, I mean, I think this comes back a lot to Darius's point about context yesterday, that if this is in context of a video game where one of the two verbs you have is kill, like, it seems sensible that that's a thing you're going to do. Um, and I think the, if you want to avoid that problem, you either lean into it and say, this is, this is fine if creating carnage is joyful to the players, or you can, you can move away from that and sort of find verbs that aren't kill and create, experience, create spaces where players are going to want to do behaviors that you want them to do. Um, I had another point I was thinking of that has slipped my mind. Hmm. Other questions? Uh, I just wanted to say that your uh, uh, computational flaneur uh, definitely seems like a roguelike because it has procedural generation and permadeath. <laughs> that is very true. And a hunger clock. <laughs> um, other questions? I just want to know, is this available to download? or? Uh, to yeah, use? it's available for free on the iOS App Store. There's no Android version. Um, but, it, but it should keep running indefinitely in Fort Mason. It's also open source if anyone feels like making an Android version, but I don't expect that to actually happen. Thanks, Mike. Great talk. Uh, oh, sorry. No, this is actually a question. <laughs> uh, any interesting emergent stories around computational flinner? Like things that surprised you or that surprised the players? Um, hmm. I've like I have had a strange disconnect of like I know how many people are using it, but I haven't actually gotten to talk to that many users outside of playtesting. Um, I think the I don't have any good, particularly amazing stories of the experience itself, other than failure states. Um, I had a lot of problems with training data where it kept reading out snippets from title pages of poetry books. So you'd have this experience of wandering through the park and hearing lists of years. <laughs> <laughs> Which was interesting in its own right, but not quite what I was going for. Actually, I'd like to follow on uh, from that question and, and just ask, I'm quite curious um, if you could give some kind of idea of the breakdown of effort in creating something like this. So you mentioned curating the GPS coordinates, training the, the neural net, um, presumably coding up the app. Um, I, I, and could you give some idea of what took the bulk of your time? Yeah, I think the bulk of the time was actually play testing and doing things in the space. Um, the, the training, like I was, I fortunately had someone else who already pre-trained a uh, 
a neural net on poetry, which is great because I didn't want to have to assemble that giant list of poetry. Um, but even if I had done that or if I hadn't had any experience with machine learning, like for these purposes, something like Markov chains would have worked just as well. Like I didn't need the power of neural nets. Um, a, that also, actually, honestly, the, a large part of development time was just duct taping stuff together of this was not a neural net that was meant to run on an iPhone. Um, and I ended up having to hack a lot of stuff together to actually get poetry generating on device because running it on servers would be prohibitively expensive even if it wasn't a free experience. Um, but separate from the day-to-day, -day, like how do you build an iPhone app that uses GPS, like wandering around the space, saying what is, what is the feeling for each region, what should each region be, took a lot of manual time. And the feedback cycle of I want to I want to walk around the space, make some changes, and then get it back in the app was a bit slower than I would have liked. Um, it's also worth calling out that I got insanely lucky. Um, you, like, if you have ever dealt with GPS in an urban space, it is often very, very bad. Um, you have issues with call urban canyons and sort of the problems of how does GPS signal attenuate with giant skyscrapers. Being in a flat park uh, on the waterfront meant all those problems didn't exist. Um, so making similar installations, you could run into very, very gnarly, painful problems that I was able to avoid. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah.